Well, we are in the Gospel of John, and we're in the seventh session, and happen to be dealing with the seventh chapter. And so, the uh, the events of chapter six transpired about one year before the cross, uh, and uh, the events in chapter seven will occur about six months later, just to give you a flavor, about October of the year. And uh, so that's where we are. And uh, verse 1, After these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. And uh, the first thing I want to call your attention, we have after these things, we have this peculiar marker. In the Greek, it's metatauta. And uh, so we've noticed this happening frequently. Um, It becomes very important when you study the book of Revelation. Because it's a major marker that's used by the Lord Jesus in partitioning that uh, book into specific segments. And uh, uh, that's why I'm beginning to suspect that John wrote the gospel after he had the Patmos experience. Because we see some of the same uh, issues surface here. And this term metatauta, after these things, it's a, a connector, but it's sort of a connector like a partition, if you will. And so... Uh, so uh, that's, meta, that's that timing marker, if you will. And uh, the events of chapter 6 took place in Galilee, at the Sea of Galilee. But before that, Jesus had been in Jerusalem, where he had risen, you know, the whole controversy that arose at the Pool of Bethesda that we talked about. And uh, that controversy has re- gotten much more serious now. And so, but it's interesting that this term metatauta will highlight an alternating between Judea and well, in chapter 1, we were in Judea. Chapter 2, we then went to Galilee. Chapter two, Later, then we came back to Jerusalem, or Judea, if you will. Then chapter 4, we went back to Galilee. He, we're almost going back and forth. John will emphasize Judea more than Galilee. The other, the synoptics really emphasize Galilee. John, less, less than that. And we're, we were in Galilee in chapter 6, and we're going to be here in Jerusalem in chapter 7. And... Uh, and we're going to, and so uh, John John lays his time out very differently, and we'll take a look at that as we go. And uh, so the Jews, he didn't walk in Jewry in the Jew, in Jewish area, because the Jews sought to kill him. So that's that's serious stuff. The uh, uh, the gathering is uh, uh, there's a storm gathering around the person of Jesus Christ, and that storm is still going on today. That storm is still going on today. The difference about uh, opinion about him uh, is more than that than any other person that's ever walked the earth. And uh, they say the worst things about him and uh, that could be ever been said, and they, that's still controversial today. Now, six months from this time here that we're looking at, the storm will break in all its fury when Jesus is on the cross. So we're moving up, and we're only about six months away from the cross. And so, now v- verse 2 says, Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. And this gives me a uh, opportunity to insert some background. As we go, I'll try to do that to bring us up to speed. A very famous rabbi indicated that the Jews' catechism is his calendar. Most of us that have been in a denominational context know there's a catechism that codifies the belief of that denomination. Well, the Jews' catechism is a calendar. It's astonishing to discover how important it is for any of us to really understand the Jewish calendar. And here we have the Feast of Tabernacles is going to be our subject. The Feasts of Israel, that's a study that's uh, worthwhile doing it in itself. There are seven Feasts of Moses. We'll take a look at those briefly, and uh, we'll study a few of them in detail. In addition to the seven Feasts of Moses, there's two more that are actual uh, Purim, uh, uh, built around the Book of Esther, and Hanukkah, course, we uh, experience around what we call Christmas. And uh, it may surprise you to know that Hanukkah is made reference in the Gospel of John. We'll discover that in chapter 10, verse 22, in a way that's rather cryptic, but provocative. We'll deal with when we get there, of course. But I want to talk a little bit as we go about hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is your theory of interpretation. All of us have an attitude or a presumption about how we interpret the Bible. And uh, we espouse a, what's called a very high hermeneutic. We take the Bible very, very seriously, every detail and so forth. But there's something else about hermeneutics. Most of us are uh, results of what would be called the Western model or the Greek model, 
we tend to think that prophecy is a prediction and fulfillment. And we love to revel in predictions in the, in the Bible and where it gets fulfilled. Prediction, fulfillment. That happens to be the Greek model. And nothing wrong with it, but that's the mindset that most of us bring to this task. There's a different model in the Jewish mind. In the Hebrew model, is prophecy is pattern. The Jewish mind is fascinated with patterns because he's discovered that pa- God uses patterns to describe what's coming. He uses patterns of Israel to describe the Messiah and vice versa. And they're, they're all linked together. And so the, we always be very sensitive to patterns. Now the feasts of Israel, um, this is the uh, representation of the menorah, the seven branch candlestick that was in the, uh, can- I should say lampstand. King James translated candlestick and we still slip. That's they're really lampstands. But anyway, um, we're going to explore a little bit what are called the appointed times. And uh, I want to remind you of something in Romans 15.4, a fundamental we need to keep in mind. Paul tells us in Romans 15.4, he says, Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Whatsoever things, what this really uh, authorizes, that everything in your Bible, this ancient history, is there, God has a purpose for you in it. So we need to understand there's value Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. So we need to understand that. And uh, that whatsoever, that's, that's a bunch. The, old, the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed, and the Old Testament is the New Testament revealed. And we, we've touched on that several times, several ways. But I also want to highlight Hosea 12.10. Here's another license or a, an authority we need to be aware of. Hosea tells us, God says to Hosea, I have also spoken by the prophets. I have multiplied visions and use similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. That phrase is an interesting one. That opens the door that highlights to us a technique God will use to communicate that goes beyond just the literal rendering of a word. And there there are figures of speech. Uh, there are similes, which are as a resemblance. There are allegories. There are metaphors. There are hypocatastases. You probably haven't gotten to that unless you studied rhetoric. But uh, there's types and analogies. These are just a sample of some. It may shock you to discover there are 200 different kinds of rhetorical devices in the Bible. They've been cataloged and they're available if you want to dig into some of our products. And I'm not uh, making a career of that. I just want you to be sensitized that a simile and an allegory are slightly different things. A metaphor is a declaration that one thing is as it represents another and so forth. And uh, so I won't try to define all these here. Just make you aware of them, if you will. And so uh, one of these rhetorical devices is known as a type. We speak of that in engineering, a prototype, for an example. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 10, it says, Now all these things happen unto them, speaking of that past, as examples they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. The word here is in your translation is examples, and that actual word in the Greek is tupos, or types. That's from where we get the idea of type which is a figure or an image or a pattern or a prefiguring of some kind. The Bible is full of types. There are actual volumes written cataloging the many different types. Some are very obvious and well-known. Others are very, very subtle and uh, a different kind altogether. Now, the brazen serpent, we encountered that when we were uh, in uh, John chapter 3. The the issue of manna came up in last session. Uh, We're going to have water from the rock occur in this session, in fact, the water came out of the rock twice in two very different ways, and we need to understand those. And there are others, the brazen altar, the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy. These are all types of the Messiah in some way or another, even the camp of Israel. These are all well-known types of different kinds. The brazen serpent, you may recall, uh, in regard to murmuring, we had these uh, serpents that uh, bit people and they died. Moses goes to the Lord. The Lord uh, is instructed to place a brass serpent on a pole on a high hill, and everyone that looked at it would be healed. Strange mechanic that God used to uh, provide that remedy. And uh, you can read the whole Old Testament and not have that explained why. Why did God use that weird way? It isn't until you get to John chapter 3, as we did that time, that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. Jesus himself explains that peculiar type that God used in Numbers 21 is explained for us in John 3. 
And that fact, it leads to the most well-known verse in the entire Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever ever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So that whole thing comes up, of course, with Nicodemus' visit. Manna, we also know from number 16, okay? And God provided that daily, a miracle bread from heaven, if you will. It was provided for six days and with a double portion on the sixth day so that you didn't have to pick up any on the seventh. Why is that so important? Because that's a number, that is in Exodus 16. The law wasn't given until Exodus 20. That tells you that the Sabbath was observed long before the law was given. It actually was ordained in Genesis chapter 2. But uh, we won't get into all that here. It was before the law was given in Exodus 20. But uh, So we're going to look at some, feast, uh, some feasts here. In Colossians chapter 2, Paul reminds us something. He says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in the respect of a holy day or of a new moon or of Sabbath days, which are a shadow, which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. Every one of these things are shadows of the future. Every one of these things we touch on have something to teach us about what's coming. A shadow of things to come. And the most dramatic ones are the feasts. That's why I want to give a little background here. Each of the feasts in the Torah commemorates some historic event. No problem. That's pretty obvious. What many people don't realize is every feast is also prophetic, has a specific prophetic role in God's program. So uh, we want to talk a little bit about calendars. The, the Jewish calendar is he heptatic. Everything's in sevens. Obviously, there's seven days make a week. We're familiar with that. Seven weeks make up a unique thing. That's where they feast, feast Shavuot. Seven, there's a week of months. The religious year goes from the first to the seventh. And the month, there's a week of years called the sabbatical year. And their failure to keep the sabbatical years would put them into, into captivity in Babylon for 70 years. And God said, you owe me 70 in effect. The, the Jubilee year, if you take every seven weeks, uh, there's a grid, but then after seven of those, after a week, seven weeks of years, the next year after that is a jubilee year. All land reverts to its owners. See, when they sell land, it wasn't what we call fee simple. It was really a lease. They sold the use of that land for a period of time, but it ultimately returned to the owners. And uh, all slaves go free on a, a jubilee year. All debts are forgiven. And Peter even uses that phrase called the rest of time or the restitution of all things, which means the Jubilee year, also to speak of the, of the, uh, the millennium coming. So those have, all have prophetic implications. But there's a term called Hamoyedim, the appointed times. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, we find this verse. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days, and for years. When we read that in the English, we say, okay, fine, I got it. We miss something, because in the Hebrew, the word for seasons is hamoyedim. It actually means the appointed times, more precisely. And uh, so, the appointed times. It turns out that if, you, if you're Jewish, you're aware of the fact that there are 70 specific times appointed in the Torah. There are 52 Sabbaths. Most of us are familiar with Saturday or Sabbath. There are seven days of Passover. There's one day in Shavuot. There's one Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement. Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, is actually seven days plus one at the end, the Shemini Etzeret. So it turns out, defined in the Torah are 70 specific appointed times. You with me so far? Okay. Well, it turns out that if you take that term, appointed times, and use it to search, have the computer search for an equidistant letter sequence, uh, it appears only once in the book of Genesis, which is statistically surprising, because you'd expect from the nature of the language that you'd expect to find that show up probably about five times in the 78,000 letters of Genesis. It turns out it doesn't. It shows up only once. And the interval at which it shows up is an interval of 70. And not only that, it is centered on... Genesis 1.14, where that term for, shows up in, in, uh, in the creation account. The odds of all this happening by just randomness is less than one chance in 70 million, by the way. Why am I getting it? One of the things we discover 
is the text, the biblical text, is, was given to Moses not only directly by God, but letter by letter. You take one letter out of it, and this all falls apart. These are properties that we discover that are staggering in their implications. So these are the feasts of the Lord. Uh, this, this, the feast we're going to look at is in Leviticus 23. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. Now what's interesting, the word feasts there is actually moed, which means a, an appointed place, a meeting, an appointed sign or signal. The word convocation is actually mikra, which is a convocation. Of, it's a rehearsal. So I want you to recognize that these feasts that they celebrate are not only historically commemorative, they're rehearsing an event that's yet to come. And we want to try to understand that. The feasts of Israel. There are three in the first month and three in the last month. The first three are in the spring, the month of Nisan. They have Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of First Fruits. These three are lumped together in about an eight-day period. So they collectively call that Passover. The season is Passover. The specific holiday it includes is Passover and two others, but they're lumped together in language very often. They speak of it was time of Passover, meaning all three of those are going to take place. Okay, They all occur in the first month, in, in the month of Nisan. There's a Feast of Weeks. between. The, I'll come back to that separately. The fall feasts are in the seventh month, and they involve the Feast of Trumpets, the Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and Feast of Tabernacles, which is the one we're going to be focusing on for John 7 here. The first three feasts prophetically speak of the first advent. And we're going to study those in some detail when we get to the last half of the Gospel of John. About half of the whole Gospel of John deals with the final week. And when we're in that time period, we'll be studying the spring feast very, very carefully, so I won't do it now. The last three feasts are the ones in the fall, and that's the ones that we're going to watch. Uh, Feast of Trumpets happens to also fall on Rosh Hashanah, which is the beginning of the years as a civil new year. But the religious year is the Feast of Trumpets, both on the same day. Now, the uh, the Feast of Weeks is a unique thing that looks a little differently, and, and I'll deal with that separately. The month of Tishri is the seventh month of the year. And you want to remember that for some Genesis reasons, their day starts at evening. The evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning were the second day. There's some reasons for that that we get into in Genesis. I don't want to derail this study getting into all of that. But I want you to be sensitive to the fact that a day starts at sundown. Okay, That's why I have the night and then the day representing the 24-hour period. You're with me. Okay, So now the, uh, the first day of the, of the month of Tishri is their, it's Rosh Hashanah. And it's, that's their new year, their civil new year. But it's also the Feast of Trumpets at Yom Kippur. Uh, and ten days later, you have Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Anyone that's known someone Jewish knows that's their big year. That is the big deal of the year for them in many ways, Day of Atonement. And the period between those two are ten days that are known as the Days of Affliction as they prepare themselves for the Day of Atonement, the Days of Affliction. And then... Five days after the Day of Atonement, we have the Feast of Booths or Sukkot, or sometimes called the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's the feast that Jesus is going to be visiting here in this chapter with some, surpri- with some, some strange surprises. Okay. The Feast of Trumpets, that's the Yom Teruah, the first of the, the fall feasts. It's coincident with the Civil New Year, and many people get that confused. It has to do with the great blowing of the trumpets. Set many people confuse this with the last trump, which is a prophetic term from a number of passages. And not, don't confuse it with the last trump or the, the seventh trumpet of, of the Revelation, which are different things. The trumpet of God only appears twice in the Bible. It's when the law was given in Exodus 19, and it's also at the rapture. Those two places are the only places that the trumpet of God occurs as a te- as a item in the text. Now, it's interesting that the will be followed by 10 days of affliction. Some people make a parallel, think there may be a parallel to that with the tribulation and so forth. The Keti of Shofar is the ram's horn. These are not the silver trumpets of the temple that are blown. And there's a Shofar as mentioned specifically, uh, uh, are not what we're using here. They're using the Shofar, which they did at the Akedah, Genesis uh, 22, and the sub, 
and the, the, even the even the left and right horn of the lamb, the the, uh, the ram has names, first and last trump. And uh, the great blowing is at three series of ten blasts each. The final blowing of the ten blasts, they're not short blasts, they're long victory blasts. That may be a link to the, the final trumpet of that series. Not to be confused, there's a whole lot of misunderstanding flowing, uh, flowing around about these trumpets. Now the last trump, many people confuse it with the, the last trumpet judgment of Revelation. They're different things. And it can't be the last because there's still trumpets being blown in the millennium. So the last trump is a misleading term in, in many studies that you may run into. And as I said, the trump of God occurs only twice. That's Exodus 19 and in 1 Thessalonians 4. And so, and the, the days of affliction are 10 days of preparation for Yom Kippur. And there may be a link to the thrashing floor of idiom in Luke 3. And uh, Ruth, the Gentile bride in the book of Ruth, is at Boaz's feet during the thrashing floor event. Some people make a big thing of that. I call to your attention for your own study. The Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the 10th of Tishri, of course, and uh, there, this is the day of national repentance for the nation Israel. And uh, it's a, this is when the, the one day of the year, the only day of the year, the high priest can enter the Holy of Holies and only after great ceremonial preparation. And God, who is seen as dwelling between the cherubims there, looking down at the broken law and the Ark of the Covenant, is propitiated by the shed blood that is uh, 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 typified by the, the offerings of the, uh, of the temple, but are actually all anticipatory uh, types of the cross at Golgotha. That's all tied together, and that's worth a very special study. And uh, this is also where the scapegoat takes place. They have two goats. One is chosen as the scapegoat. The little lottery box to pick that is actually in the third temple. They've made one they're expecting to use when the temple is rebuilt. You can visit it when you visit the Temple Institute in Jerusalem. But then we get to the Feast of Tabernacles called Sukkot or the Feast of Booths or Feast of Tabernacles. It's on the 15th of Tishri and uh, it's five days from Yom Kippur and five is normally recognized as a, day, a time of grace, if you will. And uh, so... Incidentally, it's one of the three that are compulsory to attend. And that's going to be important as we get into seven because that's overlooked by Jesus' brothers, by the way. But in any case, what they do, what Jews do today, when they, when they celebrate Sukkot, they actually build what you and I might call a camp in the backyard. They build a structure that is a temporary dwelling. They're going to live in it in seven days and plus one special Sabbath. And what they, the definitions are, there needs to be gaps in the walls and the roof so the wind can blow through to remind them of the wilderness wanderings is the idea. And uh, they leave their temporary dwellings for the permanent dwellings at the Feast of Sukkot. In other words, that's part of what it's portraying is when they leave the temporary dwellings and get the permanent dwellings. That's why many people associate the Feast of Tabernacles with the second coming of Christ. When they, when they re, 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 resurrection and all that. And uh, some people think the rapture may occur on the Feast of Tabernacles. And there are any good scholars that feel that way. I don't, and I'll show you why, but that's, a, that's just a personal thing. I'll show you when the time comes. Uh, but we do th- tend to see the Feast of Tab- Tabernacles pointing towards the millennial c- kingdom from Hosea 5 and a number of the passages and uh, where we go towards a more permanent habitation. And... Uh, there are many people that suspect that the transfiguration in Matthew 17 occurred about this time because Peter wants to build three booths. Because Moses and Elijah are there, let's build three booths. He's got these booths on his mind that causes some scholars to suspect that that was all occurring nominally in this period, time of the year. But there's a procession that is part of the Feast of Tabernacles. They have a lulav. If you've been in a Jewish group, you know the lulav has three things, a willow, and it has a myrtle, and it has a palm. The willow has no fragrance and no fruit. The myrtle has fragrance but no fruit. And the palm has no fragrance but it has fruit. And so they make a, a model out of that sort of thing. But there's also an etrog. And et- what's an etrog? You and I would mistake it for a huge lemon. It's a very, very large citrus fu- uh, fruit that uh, many of our Jewish friends import from Israel this time of year for all that sort of thing. And it has fragrance and fruit. But in, this, in addition to this procession, what you also need to understand, 
well, is, is some pouring out of the water. What they also do, they pour out water in the temple with a double portion on the last day of the feast to remind them that God gave them water from the rock in the wilderness twice. That's what they do it, to remind them of the two uh, watering. I'll come back to that in a minute. So they, they brought water from the pool of Siloam and poured it out liberally, barrels of water. And it's during that that Jesus is going to make a surprise appearance. That's what we're going to get into here. And so also during this festival, they illuminated the inner court with a regular torch parade that was comm- commemorating the pillar of fire that followed them during the wilderness wanderings and uh, by, by a fire by night and, of course, a, a smoke during the, the day. And this is going to echo in the, near the end of this chapter for some reasons. Okay. We now understand that the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire that led the Israelis, and that's incidentally children of Israel is what your King James says, the International Standard calls them Israelis. I like that. Uh, we're both pictures of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. We have the uh, first advent and the second advent, and we have this very strange thing in the Feast of Weeks. And uh, we're, as I say, we're going to study the, the spring festivals when John takes up the final week of Jesus' ministry and he devotes the last nine chapters of the book on that. And uh, uh, John's Gospel and said he only covers about 21 days of three and a half years of ministry. And, uh, but he, over half it's devoted to the final week. And about a third of the verses, 247 of the 879 verses, are devoted to just one 24-hour period. So that's all forthcoming. When we get into that, we'll get into the spring feast. We have play very heavily into that. But the uh, three times a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord. This is Deuteronomy 6.16. Before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose. Here are the three feasts. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread embraces the, all the spring feasts. The Feast of Weeks, which is right in the middle, and the Feast of Tabernacles at the end. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty. And so, because we're going to be dealing with this, I want to zero in on particularly the... Uh, well, before I get into the Feast of Tabernacles, I want to pre- zero in on the Feast of Weeks, because most people uh, have... Uh, this has been only half studied. And so, in Leviticus 23, it says, And ye shall count unto you from the morrow, after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath, shall ye number 50 days. Okay, so the Feast of Weeks is counting the Omer, 49 plus 1. That one day takes it from a Saturday to a Sunday. And it's uh, uh, one of the three compulsory feasts that every able-bodied Jew had to be in Jerusalem. It's the only feast that uses leavened bread, which is the only feast of the Bible. It does, which is, gives it a Gentile flavor, if you will. And it's prophetic, of course, of the birth of the church because historically it has its harvest issue, but in terms of the future, it predicts the birth of the church. And it is in Acts chapter 2 at the Feast of Shavuot that the birth is, that the church is birthed, begun. And, uh, and so uh, it's, that's why we always associate uh, the Feast of Weeks, or commonly called the Feast of Pentecost, with the book of Acts chapter 2. But there's the mystery of Enoch we talked about before, the oldest prophecy uttered by a prophet was, uh, was, was Enoch, of course, of the first coming of Christ. There were three groups of people, though, that faced the, the flood of Noah. Those that perished in the flood, those that were preserved through the flood, and those that were removed prior to the flood. How many people were spared the flood? Not eight, nine. Everybody overlooks the guy that was removed just, be, just prior. And so the mystery Enoch is, there is a Jewish legend, I can't, haven't been able to tra- track down the roots of it, but there's a Jewish legend that Enoch was born on Shavuot. Okay? And, uh, and also they believe that Enoch was removed, translated, um, on his birthday. That's just a Jewish legend. But what's provocative about that is if Enoch is a type of the church, and some people see him that way, is it possible that the feast of weeks is only half fulfilled in terms of the birth of the church might it not also like Enoch be the day of its translation or Harpazzo just a speculation and uh, uh, I mentioned it just as, uh, for something you can look at and come to your own conclusions on and so uh, is it possible that the Jewish clock 
will restart on the very day that it was stopped because the church and Israel are mutually exclusive. And so I'll leave you with that. But I want to give a few caveats here. One of the things that will happen is the more you study the Jewish background, the more fascinating you'll find it. You want to be cautious. It's really worth studying it, the richness of our heritage. We need to understand that. But at the same time, we want to be careful. The, those, those patterns will teach us. But you want to be careful you don't fall into the trap of legalism. Okay? Uh, you want to study carefully Acts 15 and the Council of Jerusalem, which emphasize the fact that as Gentiles, we are not under the law. And uh, Abraham was saved before he was circumcised and before the law was given. We need to not lose sight of that. And you want to be, and so you want to, uh, uh, something else you'd like to know, the Millennial Temple will only be open on Shabbat and the new moons. It's closed on Sunday. So that, there's a lesson there. And so appreciating our Jewish heritage is useful, but you want to make sure you don't get drawn under the law and though, and so doing nullify the completed work of our Messiah. And uh, that's a critical issue to take, take uh, under advisement. In Romans 8, 3.20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified to sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law is our mirror to show us our need for a Savior. But, uh, therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Romans 3. So that's what the epistle of Romans is all about, is to really nail those things. And, uh, so. But it's interesting that these three required feasts, the three compulsory feasts, parallel three major milestones. The cross the church, and the second coming are modeled under Deuteronomy 16, 16. Those particular feasts are ordained as compulsory to the Jew. Well, it's, we got, that's all by way of background. Let's jump in and pick it up. Verse 3, his, speaking, getting back to John 7. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, for he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. See, that's his, those are his brothers. He had four brothers. And they're not believers. So they're taunting him to, to go publicly. But notice uh, verse 5 of chapter 7 highlights a key issue. Neither did his brethren believe in him. Two of them end up becoming believers after the resurrection. James and Jude. Become very, very prominent in the early church. But... Uh, that's after the resurrection. So, so there, you see, there were sons of Mary too, and there, those are well recorded and so forth. And uh, so they're, they're challenging him to show himself openly. And their disbelief, by the way, was prophesied in Psalm 69, verse 8, by the way. That's an interesting study on its own right, but we'll keep moving here. Now, his brothers asked him to go with them, and Jesus said, appears to say no. He doesn't say no, he says not yet, by the way. Then he goes in secret. He tells them he's not going, so they go. He's not going to be going. They go. And as soon as they're gone, he does go in secret, different way. And uh, that's, a, that's caused that, a lot of misunderstandings about that passage. It's interesting to me that his brothers didn't do their homework because they knew he was Jewish and he would keep the law. He was required by law to go. But they apparently didn't connect the dots or didn't do their homework. Okay. Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it, that the works thereof are evil. Go ye up to, unto this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full, not yet full come. Now remember that first verse we looked at. There is there are plots around to kill him. The tensions are not trivial here. They're very, very heavy. He is actually under threat of death. So he's not going openly. He is going to go low profile, and he's going to make a public appearance, interestingly enough. We'll see. But uh, this is widely misunderstood. And, he, and so uh, he was not going to go down there to in favor of the public or do something spectacular or whatever. Uh, that, that was what they wanted him to do. He is on his own schedule. It's astonishing to study how study carefully Everything in his life, everything is on his schedule. The issues in Gethsemane were on his schedule. Judas had not planned to betray him that night. But at the Lord's Supper, Jesus declares that he's going to, which forced his hand. 
because the word was out. If he was going to do it, he had to do it that night. Why? Because Jesus called the, called the tomb. And you just when you start to, when we get into that, it's amazing to discover how every detail is under the control of the Messiah. It shouldn't surprise us, but it's interesting to discover that. But in any case, he's saying that he's not going, but of course he will. And uh, so I go not yet into this, he says. And so my time has not yet come, but his time is coming. His time is coming. He's made a, he, no right. He's not trying to make a reputation for himself. And he's not interested in any secret of popularity. And he's going to deal with all that when we get to John 15. Let's move on here to verse 9. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast. Not openly, but as it were, in secret. Pretty straightforward passage. And it causes a lot of people to puzzle because he said he wasn't going and then he does. Gee, he told a little white lie. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. He, was, he said, told him he wasn't going yet. If they'd done their homework, they know he'd have to go. But anyway, uh, he didn't go up then, that is, with his brethren. And uh, the, the Greek word, I go up, is sending to Jerusalem in the celebration of the completed harvest. He will. And these three feasts are pr- pr- prophetic of Jesus. The Passover, of course, as his high priest offering himself as the Paschal Lamb of God. We're going to see that uh, later. Shavuot, the pe- Pentecost, 50 days later after the Holy Spirit. And then Sukkot, Tabernacles, where he returns to Jerusalem to establish his kingdom. And that's what he's going to model out here. Verse 11, when, Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said, He is a good man. Others said, Nay, but he deceiveth the people. Albeit no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. You know, this kind of political correctness is something that's gaining uh, uh, strength in our culture. You're guarding what you really think because it's not politically correct. And this is, uh, th- this is more modest here than it was there, but that's still pretty serious. In the United States, the Bill of Rights has been abnegated, but very few sense the dangers. It's changing. But anyway, here, the, t- the tensions are getting. We should not be surprised at these differing views. It's been about a year and a half since the Bethesda incident, which, which started this we're going to kill him kind of thing, and it's been brewing worse. And of course, political correctness prevails even today. They didn't because for fear of the Jews. Shame on us, too. Shame on us, too. And uh, are there times that we're not bold enough? Verse 14, now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. So he comes out from under his cover, so to speak, and he's in there publicly. And apparently, quite suddenly, he appeared in the temple. And uh, now the Feast of Tabernacles is portraying in advance the coming of Christ and his return to the earth. And it speaks of the consummation of all things. And he will appear suddenly. Malachi 3.1 points that out. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. He's not talking about John 7. He's talking about Revelation 19, but still, that's coming. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? <laughs> and so they're, they're, uh, they apparently have a pretty impressive lesson in the temple by him. And they're puzzled because he wasn't a seminary graduate. <laughs> well, enough of all of that. I won't get into, into the deficiency of our schooling systems. We'll move on here. It's interesting, even his enemies had to admit Never a man spake like this man. And they're going to do that before this chapter is over. And uh, they marveled. Okay. Jesus answered, that, <coughs> Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. And here is a key verse for your memory list. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Wow, there's a challenge, gang. Jesus says, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. And that's a dandy. The word doctrine is singular, meaning it's an integrated whole. And uh, so uh, that's the key verse, John 7, 17. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. And, uh, okay. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that speaketh, he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true and no unrighteousness is in him. And uh, 
Did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keepeth the law. Boy, there's an indictment. These guys were professional law keepers. That was their profession, the Pharisees were. Did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keepeth the law? Why go ye about to kill me? The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil who goeth about to kill thee. They either denying it or were uninformed in any case. See, the law is the mirror to show us that we are lost sinners. It's a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Okay. And, uh, Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and ye all marvel. Moses therefore gave, you, uh, gave unto you circumcision, not because it is Moses, but of your fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. Moses therefore gave you unto circumcision. It's interesting that circumcision required them to break the law. That's an interesting aspect of that. And uh, so, now, see, circumcision is a rite that goes back to Abraham, long before Moses, by the way. So it's older than the Mosaic law. And it's optimized on the eighth day. I'm always fascinated by this. Because they scientifically know it. How did he know? See, if you look, it, 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 you, if, you, if you make a graph, you'll discover there's a, a vitamin K that's a clotting element that's not formed until the fifth to the seventh day. And then there's also um, prothrombin that is also necessary. It, it, about the third day, it's about 30% of normal. Then it goes, at the eighth day, it peaks. So if you're going to circumcise an infant, your safest day to do that happens to be on the eighth day. Now we know that today from obvious studies. What I'm wondering about is how did Abraham know? Trial and error? I don't think so. I'll let you think that through. Okay. Let me go on here. If a man on the Sabbath, did Jesus says, if a man on the Sabbath day received circumcision that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me because I've made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? See, they obviously broke the Sabbath day every time somebody had to be circumcised on an eighth day that happened to be on the Sabbath. They thought nothing would break the Sabbath to keep that law, so they're just being silly, in other words. So it's older than the law. So Jesus is really warning them against making superficial judgments. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And then said some of them of judgment, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? The word's getting around. Some of them of Jerusalem. And uh, there's this term for that. They're basically just residents of Jerusalem. But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ, that is the Messiah? Albeit we know this man whence he is. But when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. And they're, re- they're repeating a rabbinical belief, which is a belief in the virgin birth, whether they realize it or not. No man knoweth. That's a rabbinical admission that the Messiah was to be supernaturally born. Interestingly enough, no man knows what he is. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, Ye both know me, and ye know whence I am, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. But I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. This is quite an oratorical response here. He's basically saying, Do you really know me? You think you know me, you see me, but you don't really know me. You think you know where I came from, but you don't really know. That's really what he's saying to them, in effect. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come. It's interesting, even though they were anxious to take him, they couldn't touch him until his hour came. And there will be an hour that he, that he does. He not only allows it, he arranges it. Gabriel told Daniel the exact day that that was to happen. And he not only fulfilled it, he shockingly held them accountable to know that day. And we'll get into all that later in the, in the thing. So not a hair of our heads can be touched without his permission, the scripture tells us. And so, for me to live as Christ or die as gain. Anyway, John uh, 7.31, And many of the people believed on him, and said, when Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man has done? And the uh, Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him. The Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Now, this is really surprising because they were sent to arrest him, but they don't rep- 
report back for four days, it turns out. And, uh, but six months from now, they will. Of course, that'll be the cross. We're only months away from that. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while, and I am with you. And then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me. And where I am, thither ye cannot come. Interesting. It's interesting. After his death on the cross, only loving hands will touch him, and only loving eyes will see him. And uh, we'll move on here. Where I am, you cannot come. And that's all through the scriptures too, by the way. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go that we shall not find him? Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? The term dispersed there is diaspora, by the way. But anyway, what manner of saying is this that he said, Ye shall seek me and shall not find me, and where I am, thither ye cannot come. And uh, so the, the dispersed is speaking to the Jews outside Israel, and that's very prophetic, of course. In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And he that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now bear in mind that the, the, the last day is the big deal where they're, double, they're pouring out all this water, and he goes there to make this speech there. And uh, the, uh, um, the, 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 that day is they pour out a double portion of the water. Well, it's interesting that at both Meribah and Rephidim, that happened twice. And uh, water from the rock. Many people haven't really picked up on this. Let's get into this a little bit. At waters at Meribah. Uh, at Rephidim, they, they had water. For, uh, Moses was told to strike the rock, right? The rock, water came for them. They were, uh, that was Exodus 17. At Meribah, he was told to ask the rock for the water. But Moses was so frustrated, he was angry, and he struck the rock that time too. And because he did, he didn't inherit. It's been 120 years. 40 years in Egypt, and 40 years in the backside of the desert, and then 40 years in the wilderness. 120-year career. And his dream was to enter the land. And God, after Mary said, called him aside and says, uh, you blew it, buddy. I wasn't mad at them. I told you to ask the rock. And you know, we hear that thing seems like you're splitting hairs. After all that, that puts him in the penalty box? Yeah. He didn't re 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 reflect him properly. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10.4, the rock that followed them was Christ. The rock, idiomatically, was Christ. And the first time striking the rock, he was Christ was struck in his first coming. This, if, he, if Moses had done it properly, this thing would model his second coming. As a, as, a, as a thing. But Moses didn't inherit, but he gets another chance. I think he's one of the two witnesses in Revelation 11. But that again, he was denied entry to the land at that time. And so, come. Turn your back on the world. Abandon confidence in yourself. Come empty-handed. Not to the Lord's table. Not to baptism. Not to a priest. Not to a minister or to a church. What do you come to? To Christ himself. It's all about a person. It's all about a person. To Christ himself and none other. See, he was in the most religious place in the, possible on the place of the earth. That was, it's not a place, it's a person. That's what it's all about. So drink, make him your own, fulfill your constant craving. That's his challenge. Anyway, but this he spake of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. And for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Whoa! There's an insight here. The Holy Ghost was not yet given. Why? Because a prerequisite condition was for Jesus to be glorified. It's interesting that once he's glorified and goes to heaven, the Holy Spirit's in his place in terms of having locality. It's in each of us. That was not true in the Old Testament. It is in the New. Forever? No. Until the rapture. There's an interval that we happen to be beneficiaries of. The Holy Spirit has not been given because Jesus is not yet glorified. See, the Holy Spirit didn't come in that sense until Acts chapter 2. Then he came to, to indwell believers and to form them into one body. And the coming of the Holy Spirit on that day assures us that Jesus had arrived back at the Father's throne. 
the fact that the Holy Spirit was given at Pentecost is an authentication or a validation that Christ's giving of himself was effective. And so there's apparently an exclusiveness in the Godhead. The Holy Spirit was not free to indwell the believers until after Jesus was glorified. Interesting. The arrival of the Holy Spirit was an authentication, as was the resurrection, of course. And so the Holy Spirit was not given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard the saying, said, of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? <laughs> Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? That guy had it right. He had read, he'd read Isaiah. Remember Isaiah 9, 6? We see it every Christmas. For unto, unto, uh, <clears throat> for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Those are not synonymous. Those are not synonymous, by the way. The, uh, they're not synonymous. The child was born in Bethlehem. The son was given at Golgotha. Okay. So there was division among the people because of him, and some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. And that's exactly what uh, Jesus warned them. Think not that I come to send peace on earth, I come not to send peace but a sword. That's a surprising, that's a first to quote sometimes in a Bible study, Matthew 10, 34. Think not that I come to send peace on earth. Jesus said that? Yeah. I come not to send peace but a sword. He said in Matthew 10, 34. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. That's what he's predicting. And that happens. Vision of the people. Okay. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees and said unto them, Why have ye not brought him? The officers, the officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Interesting. Interesting. Then answered the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the, or the, of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people knoweth not the law, are cursed. But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. That's the official statement of the leadership. Have any of the rulers believed? <laughs> well, Nicodemus steps forth. Oh, and there's our friend from chapter 3. Nicodemus saith unto them, parenthesis, he that came to Jesus by night being one of them, Doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? So he, may, he raises some questions. Nicodemus. It's been a year and a half since John chapter 3. In uh, John 3, it was, it was the midnight meeting with Nicodemus. We'll call this meeting the twilight as a relationship. And we're going to see, by the time we get to chapter 19, the daylight in the soul. Because he and Joseph Arimathea are going to take the body off the cross. So here's a very prominent person that's in the picture for us. They answered and said unto him, and the Pharisees answering responded, they're upset by Nicodemus taking his side. They answered unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. Wrong, by the way. Don't judge the word of God by rumors or the uninformed. I'll come to any man went to his own house. Now, prophets out of Galilee. You want a couple? Jonah and Nahum both came out of Galilee. Both went were, were ministers to Nineveh. What about Hosea, Elijah, Elisha, Amos? We're not sure, but could have been. And uh, obviously the Galilean ministry was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 9, by the way. So these wise guys hadn't done their homework. So, okay. Let's talk about the next session. This is... Uh, I use this uh, session to try to highlight a little bit of the calendar and the, the Feast of Tabernacles because it's so prominent here. Um, in the next chapter, I want you for next time to read it carefully and be prepared to see through the very polite King James English. There is a vigorous confrontation between Jesus and the Pharisees. And they are both going to start calling each other names. And it's, a, it's, a, it's one of 
the most interesting chapters in the Bible because uh, because of rather vigorous uh, statements that Jesus declares of himself. So he basically claims to be the voice of the burning bush, among other things. And it's, uh, it's one of my favorite passages. So read chapter 8 for next time as Jesus explains himself a little more clearly to the Pharisees and the leadership. And with that, let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this chapter. We thank you for its insights. We pray, Father, that you would help us to be ever more effective for you. Help us to understand your scenario, your timing, and the patterns that instruct us.